don't have a PowerPoint tonight, so, you know, just is what it is. I know, laziness. It's just laziness. That's what it is. That's what it is. When you think about somebody being spoiled, what do you think about? Now, I didn't say spoiled. You noticed that. I said spoiled. <laughs> we were talking about uh, uh, some, some kids this morning and, you know, and how they treat their parents and different things like that. And occasionally you come across kids that are just spoiled. You know, and, and you can tell it right away. I remember uh, a friend of mine in school saying they were not never going to have any kids because they ate pretty frequently at McDonald's when they had the playground. You know what, y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that's where the sport kids go, all right? And you watch that for a little bit and that's liable to make you go away from having kids. They don't do that so much anymore. But what does that mean? I mean, when we think about someone who is spoiled, you know, I, I looked it up. I looked up the definitions. You know, what is that talking about? And, and according to the Internet, because it knows all, the Internet says that spoiled means harmed in character by being treated leniently or indulgently. And I thought whenever I looked at that, I thought, y'all spelt that wrong. It's spoilt. That's exactly what that is. That's exact. And oh my, isn't that true? It does not just apply to children. It absolutely does not. What I want to look at tonight is the idea that possibly in some ways we are spoiled. Think about, you know, the, the live stream. We, we're not live streaming today because we don't have internet. You know, we get used to certain things being a certain way. And I, and I thought last night, I, you know, I thought, okay, we don't have internet at the building. Is there any other thing that I need to make sure that is done, you know, besides the live stream working? Because that's really all, you know, we're concerned about. And so I, nothing came to mind. Nothing came to mind till I got here <laughs> and realized that our PowerPoint was not on the computer up there because it doesn't synchronize with the internet. And so we had to finagle to, to get that to work. We're spoiled. We're spoiled. You know, I mentioned uh, last week or a week before about air conditioning, you know, and how used to air conditioning we have gotten. Uh, I, I'm reminded of that every time we go to camp, okay? <laughs> It, you know, we get spoiled. And, and, you know, some of that, some of that, you know, we, we call it being spoiled, but it's not really. Uh, you know, we just get used to certain things a certain way, and, and we want to keep on going that way. And, and whenever I think about spoiled, and, and we're going to look this evening about how being spoiled can affect our worship, how it can, it can affect, you know, our interaction with our God. And I want you to consider this evening, when we are lenient or indulgent in our worship, things go badly wrong. Just look at the world. Look at all of the different denominations that are out there that are doing this, that, and the other in their worship services. Why? Because there was someone who did not say, no, you can't do that because the Bible doesn't allow for that. Or there was someone who said, you know what, maybe we'll try that. And, and they've indulged in someone's desires. And so we have these things that, that change worship. We're going to look at the five acts of worship this evening that are taught in Scripture. And my goal tonight is not to talk about, you know, why we do these things in worship. You know, if you want to hear a lesson about that, let me know. what We'll do a lesson on that. But we're just going to go by the fact that these things are done in worship. And we're going to look at how uh, being spoiled might affect those things. Okay. So the first one we want to think about is how does it affect preaching? How does being spoiled affect preaching? Go to Acts chapter 20. 
We're going to look at a couple of verses there, but Acts chapter 20. If you'll remember, Paul is on his missionary journeys. He's, he's kind of coming back from Macedonia uh, down through some of those places, and he winds up uh, in verse 6 in Troas, where he stayed, it says, seven days. All right? Why did he stay seven days? Well, in verse 7, it tells us, if you'll read with me, now on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. All right? Now, the, the wording there is a little different depending on what version you're looking at, but literally as they had been brought together, as they were gathered together, as, as in an outside force uh, is gathering them together. So this is not them coming together on their own. It is a gathering that, where they have been brought together. And so on the first day of the week, what do we have here? This is the worship assembly. And so they are gathering there in Troas, and Paul has waited seven days so that he can go and he can break bread with the brethren there in Troas. And then it says, starting in the middle of that verse, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. So there I set out the precedent for this sermon. No, I'm not going to preach till midnight. <laughs> I don't think I've got that much energy in me. I'll tell you what, that, I can't imagine that. Now, you, you know, a lot of people have talked about that. Consider, I'll just throw this out there. We don't know really when he started. So, you know, consider that whenever it says he preached till midnight, all right? But why, what is he doing? He is in the worship assembly, and he is preaching the word. When we think about being spoiled and how that can affect that, I want you to think about another verse here in, in chapter 20 of Acts. I want you to see what he told the Ephesian, Ephesian elders in verse 27. He said, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Whenever I think about preaching today, and you, you go back and you look at some of the recordings, some of the sermons from you know, past years, and I'm talking 50, 60, 100 years, Maybe not 100, but you know, I don't know about any recordings that far back. It's different, isn't it? For the most part, our preaching is different. Why? Why is it different? There could be a number of factors in that, but I do believe that one of the factors is that we have become spoiled. You see, preaching used to be something that you went to go hear. That was why you, if somebody's preaching down here, we're going to go hear what he has to say. Well, that is not the case anymore. There are so many other things going on, so many things to distract us in this world. And you know what? That preacher down there just wants me to do things that I'm not willing to do. And so because of that, in an indirect way, preaching in a lot of places, has become, you know, just give me what I want to hear. Just preach it just to make me feel good. Because we got to fill this building up. You see, we got to, we got to fill the pews up. And so we got to have this feel-good preaching. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul talked about this in verses 3 and 4. He said, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. You think Paul might have had some insight there? Because we sure have seen that happening in the religious world today. Being spoiled absolutely affects preaching. Absolutely. We need to learn in our worship services to listen to the preaching of the gospel. I have sat and I've heard preachers tell story after story after story. Now, I like to tell a good story. 
But you're not here to tell, hear me tell stories. You're here for me to preach the gospel, the, the word of God. That's what we're supposed to be getting into. But so many people have grown weary of hearing the truth of the gospel. And it's apparent in many of our congregations. Matter of fact, you just look around tonight at all of the empty seats. Now, there's a good number of you here, and I'm not fussing about that. But there's a lot of seats that could be filled here tonight, but they're not. Why? Well, could be members of the church that don't want to come and hear another sermon. Could be members of the community who just don't want to be told that they're living the wrong lifestyle. Could be a number of things. But a lot of it comes down to the idea we're spoiled. We're spoiled. When I was growing up in the Lord's church, if we had a gospel meeting, it was from Sunday till Friday night. And I know before my time, they talked about it would go two weeks long sometimes. Why don't we do that anymore? Why have we cut it down to Sunday through Wednesday night? We're spoiled. We're spoiled. How does being spoiled affect our praying? Praying is part of worship. In Acts chapter 12 and verse 5, if you'll turn with me over there, you should be pretty close since you were there in Acts. In Acts chapter 12, Peter has been put into prison. And the church is gathered together. Look at verse 5 with me. It says, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Now, it doesn't say that that was the worship assembly. I understand that, but I'm just throwing that out there as an example. The church prays. The church prays. So how does being spoilt affect that? Turn with me to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. We're going to look at a couple of passages in James. A spoiled child, think about this. We talked about that, that idea of being spoiled. A spoiled child is one who is used to getting what they want. Nothing's been held back. You know, oh, he's just so precious. Let him do what he's going to do. You know, that sort of thing. I want you to look with me at what it says here in James chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Does that not sound like a spoilt child? Constantly asking, you know, for, what can you do for me? How does this help me? Never looking at someone else, never looking outside and saying, how can I help situations? How does this help me? And it hinders our prayers. Notice what he says there. You ask and don't receive because you ask amiss so that you can spend it on your pleasures. Whenever we go to our Father in prayer, what is in our hearts? What is in our minds? And I'm not suggesting that we're all doing this wrong. That's, that's not what I mean. But what I want us to think about is how has this society that we live in, this spoiled society... And we do live in a spoiled society. How has that, this affected how do we go to our Father in prayer? Do we not go to our Father asking for things that we don't need to be asking for at times? You know, Lord, give me such and such or give me this or would you please do this? And, and, and the Lord's saying, you know what, that's not what's best for you. And we just keep on and keep on and keep on. And so in one aspect, when we think about being spoiled, that, that hinders our prayers. When we don't, we don't go to, to the Father to ask for the right things. Go over to James chapter 1. 
And I want you to notice what he says there uh, in verses 6 and 7. He says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. And so we ask, but we don't receive because we ask amiss. We ask it, it's not according to the will of God. And then because we don't receive, it fills our hearts full of doubt. And then whenever we go to the Father, you know, we're praying these things and we're saying these words. But is our heart really in that? Do we believe that God will give us what we want? Do we believe that God will give us, let me say it this way, will He give us what we need? I got out of the habit, uh, and, and I'm still trying to get back into this habit, but I got out of the habit of, of, you know, in my prayers, saying to God, your will be done. And that's the way we need to pray. If, yes, I, you know what? I am going to ask for things in my life. I'm going to ask for healing for people. I'm going to ask for, for comfort for people. I'm going to ask for him to continue to bless me because he's blessed me so much. But I'm going to, I'm going to finish that with the idea, Lord, let your will be done. Because you know what's best. I don't know what's best. But you see, we're spoiled. And we want things the way we want it. We need to learn to pray without doubt that God will, can and will answer our prayers if we ask in the right way. It affects our singing. I think probably this was the, this was the, uh, the motivation for this sermon was the idea of, of music in the church. When we think about all the things that are done in the world that are different from what comes from the Bible, go to Colossians chapter 3. We'll start there. Colossians 3. In verse 16 of Colossians 3, he says... Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another how? In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. To say that singing is an important part of our worship does not do it justice. It really is an important part of our worship. You know, when we think about preaching, the, the vast majority of us, I say us, I'm just going to include me in all that, even though I'm the one up here standing here talking. The vast majority of the members are sitting there and listening. You know, there's one that is doing that. When there is a prayer being prayed, you know, most everyone else is just listening and, and should be focusing on the, the one leading the prayer and making that your own. But when we get to singing, that ought to be all of us. Every single one of us ought to be engaged in that. He tells us in Colossians 3.16 to admonish one another in psalms and hymns. If you are not singing, you are not teaching and admonishing. You are not fulfilling the will that God put in His Word. And I feel like some of that comes from being spoiled. See if I can illustrate this for you. Whenever you're driving down the road to go somewhere, what do you do? Turn on the radio. Yeah, some people are listening to music, some people are listening to talk show, whatever. But the fact of the matter is, we do that in a way for entertainment. Now, I know some people listen to the Bible, some people listen, you know, whatever. But it, we use that as a distraction. 
we use that as a distraction. When we ought to really be focused on the road, I wish more people would turn off radio and focus on the road. It would be so much easier to get back and forth on the interstate. We have entertainment around us nonstop. At a moment's notice, we can turn things on and be entertained just like that. We are spoiled. And because of that, we get into a worship assembly and, and you see what the world has done with this. You know, it's, it's not like what I'm listening to on the radio, so we got to do something about this. Hey, let's bring in some instruments in here. Let's get a band in here. You know, we could do that if we really wanted to. I mean, we've got a band in amongst us. We could, we could make this happen. Is that what the Lord wants us to do? I enjoy music. I really do. But whenever it's everywhere, I remember the movie, The Incredibles. In The Incredibles, the, the villain guy, he was all about making these gadgets to, make, to, to, to give to all these people so that everybody could be superheroes. And the phrase that he said in that movie is, when everyone's super, no one will be. It applies in so many ways to different things. When our entertainment is constantly before our eyes, it requires more and more and more and more and more to entertain us. Because it's not special anymore. I remember growing up and going to congregations hour, hour or so away just to go to a singing so that we could gather together and sing hymns to our Lord with a group of people because that was special. But it's, it's just gotten mundane. And we get used to that. And so, you know, sometimes we just sit and listen. We just want to listen. Maybe it's not exciting enough. And so we've got to add things to that. Singing is supposed to be done from the heart. The, the, uh, the parallel verse to this, or the sister verse to this, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, he says, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Our singing is not about making harmony. Lord willing, Saturday, I'm going to the Scarborough Church of Christ in Oak Ridge, and we're going to spend a day doing a singing workshop. I've never done anything like this before, and so it probably will crash and burn, but we're going to do the best we can do. I can't help but wonder, because I, I remember singing workshops growing up, and the people who came out for that. And I'm excited and scared at the same time to see how many people show up for this. I know about how many people are, you know, members of that congregation. And I'm curious. How many people will really even care? But why do we do those? We do those to improve the singing, don't we? And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but let me tell you something. If that's the only reason, now, whenever I start teaching singing... I don't start with a songbook. I start with the Bible. Because I want them to understand, look, if, if, if having good harmonies is your goal, that is your only goal here, I'm going to stop right now and I'm going to go to the house. Because God doesn't care about whether we're in tune. God cares what's coming from our heart. But He commands us to sing. We need to use our voices. We need to teach and admonish one another, whether it sounds good or not. I probably told you this story, but I won't tell it again because it's a, it's a good boy. It taught me. <laughs> it taught me. 
We had a member that I grew up with. She was about the same age as I was. She could not sing. <laughs> yeah, what is that phrase we use down south? Bless her heart. I mean, really. And she wanted to so bad. And from time to time, there would be a funeral, and, and so we would call, you know, for the singers. You know, sometimes they'd want singers to come and sing. You know, maybe it would be congregational. Maybe we, you know, the singers would be off in a different room. There's different ways of doing it. And I remember this funeral that came about, and, and we just announced it. You know, that if, you know, whoever wants to come sing at this funeral, you know, show up here such and such a time. And there she was. There she was. And I wondered, how on earth are we going to get through this? When we got done with that funeral, my uncle was doing the funeral. When we got done with that funeral, he said, you have never sounded better than that right there. Now, I don't know if that's because we all tried to overpower her, you know, whatever. But, but it taught me. It taught me we need to not focus on how we sing. We need to focus on the fact that we are singing. And do not be spoiled. I, I grew up spoiled. My mother had a fabulous voice, has a fabulous voice. I grew up spoiled. Except she'd wake me up with that every morning singing, and that just annoyed me, but whatever, yeah. Sing. Sing. Don't allow these petty worldly ideas to keep you from singing. Be involved in our worship. And then being spoiled has its effect on our contribution. It has its effect on our contribution. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I'm sure you're familiar with these verses. Beginning in verse 1, says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also on the first day of the week, literally according to the first day of the week, which means the first day of each week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there may be no collections when I come. And So this, this contribution, this is a part of our worship. This is something we are giving to God. You go through Scripture, and whenever they built the tabernacle, you, you see you know, Moses calling for the congregation to, to bring your contributions. And they brought, and they brought, and they brought. Later on, whenever they were repairing the temple, they did the same thing, and they kept bringing and kept bringing, and finally they had to say, Stop, we got too much stuff. Giving back to the Lord is a big deal. It's part of our worship. How does being spoiled affect that? Well, I think you can figure out where we're going with this. I want what I want, and then if I've got some left over, I'll give that to God. Isn't that the way many view that? I remember a story one time. Here I am telling stories. I remember a story one time, it, a preacher told the story, and I don't know if it's true or not, but it was, it was talking about this little boy, his mama gave him $5 to put in the contribution. And the plate came along, and, and that little boy pulled out a rubber band and put in that collection plate. And his mama saw that and just let it go. After services, Mama came to that little boy and says, I gave you that $5 bill to put in the collection plate. What would you do with that $5 bill? He said, I, I put it in my wallet. She said, why would you put it in your wallet? He said, I'm saving for a new baseball glove. Now, you can understand he's going to get a thrashing and all that stuff, all right? But we need to be careful we don't have that same mindset. We need to be careful. Why don't we give more than we do? I'm not complaining about y'all's giving, okay? 
I'm not. We have a wonderfully giving congregation, and I thoroughly appreciate to see that because you want to see the Lord's work getting done. But why don't we give more? Why don't we give more? Understand this. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I don't want you to feel too guilty about this because there's a, you know, there's got to be thought put in this. He says, beginning in verse 6 of uh, 2 Corinthians 9, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let us each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So there are a couple of things that I want you to notice from what he says in verse 7. Purpose in your heart what you're going to give. That means put thought behind it. That means whenever the plate comes around, I'm not fumbling in my wallet to see if I've got any money that I can throw in the plate. I have thought about it ahead of time. I have prepared that ahead of time. And I know what I'm going to give to the Lord. And you know what? It's going to be based, you go back to, to 1 Corinthians 16, it's going to be based upon how the Lord has prospered me. Okay? And I'm not, you know, that's not a challenge. I mean, I'm just saying, you know, we, people got to eat. God knows you got to eat. And so you've got your bills to pay, but you know what you can give to the Lord. He says, so give it not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. We ought to be ecstatic about being able to give back to our God. I don't know the statistics, but I know every time that I look it up, those who are in the, the poorer class are always giving more percentage-wise than those who are in the richer class. Always, every time, it comes out that way. Why? Because when you're poor, you learn to rely on God. When you're rich, you're spoiled. So we need to think about our giving. Give to the work of the Lord and give it cheerfully. Do we not think, and you, read chapter 9, read through that and see what he's saying there. Basically, he's saying you can't outgive God. And if you'll give, he'll supply what you need. Don't worry about it. And so we need to think about that. And then the last one here, it has, being spoilt has an effect on our eating. Okay, specifically eating the Lord's Supper. All right? Being spoilt has an effect on our eating of the Lord's Supper. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we read there, Paul you know, tells about the Lord's Supper, how it's established, beginning in verse 23. He says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. The Lord's Supper is a very important part of our worship. I don't understand why different religious organizations don't do this every first day of the week. I don't. I don't understand that. There's nothing in Scripture that tells us, yeah, just do it when you want to. Do it once a month. Do it once a quarter. 
Everything that we have in Scripture, and I'm not going to go through all those verses, but everything we have in Scripture points to every first day of the week you partake of the Lord's Supper. Why? To remember the sacrifice, His death, until He comes. It is a very important thing that we go through during our worship service. And when we are spoiled, it affects that. What do I mean by that? When we're spoiled, we're thinking about when we're going to get out of here. I remember a time when the Lord's Supper was served toward the end of services. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I don't, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But you get the preaching out of the way, you get everything out of the way, and then you have the Lord's Supper, and then you go home. You know, you're going to fix lunch or whatever. When we're spoiled, our mind is not on that Lord's Supper. It's on, okay, what's, you know, what are we going to have for lunch? When you're spoiled, you take that time to think about other things. You know, this week, I've got some stuff I've got to get done, and and so it's a quiet time. I can sit and I can think, you know, okay, I've got to work on this and I've got to work on that. I've got to get a haircut this week. I noticed while I was in there in the mirror and it's, it's getting on my ears. I don't like that. You see, we have that downtime and, and, and if we're spoiled. Now, listen, I understand there are times when things pop in our head, okay? I get that. I have that trouble too. I mean, I'm sitting down here, you know, going through the Lord's Supper right along with you, but sometimes my mind drifts to what am I getting ready to preach? And I really have to struggle to get my mind to where it's supposed to be. I am so thankful that we have Scripture and we have, you know, what we do before the Lord's Supper because it helps us to get our minds involved in what we're doing. I've, I've seen it done the other way, and it's not nearly as engaging when you just get up there and say a prayer and take the Lord's Supper and get it done. It's just not nearly as engaging. We need to remember why we're doing that. We're doing it to remember Christ, but I want you to notice something in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 16 and 17. It's right there close. Notice what he says here. He says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For, though, for we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. What's he talking about? He's talking about fellowship. He's ta that's what that word communion means. It means fellowship, it means communion, it means participation, it means all of us doing this together. Part of that has to do with the fact that as we are assembled, we are having this fellowship one with another. But I want you to notice what he points out. It's the communion of the blood of Christ. We are participating in taking the blood of Christ. Now it's not a literal thing. It represents that. But as we are partaking the Lord's Supper, we are partaking in His death. We are participating in His death along with Him. That is an extremely important part of our worship. Where does our minds go? What do we think about? Can we not for five minutes? I didn't time it this morning, but I'm going to guess it's about five minutes. Can we not for that short a time focus on our Savior who gave us everything? Remember the Lord when you eat the supper. We can be spoiled to the point that we don't take our worship seriously. I've been there in my life. I mean, I was raised in the church, 
But oftentimes when you're raised in the church, you take a lot of those things for granted. You don't think about those different things. You're just going through those motions. I'll tell you right now, I grew up spoiled. Now, we didn't have everything. We didn't have everything. But I'm spoiled, and I know I'm spoiled today. I mean, my wife, she is awesome, let me tell you. And I appreciate that. We don't need to let that get in the way of our worship. Whenever we come through those doors, we we come to gather and we come to, to be before our God, it has to be all about our God and none about me. We need to learn to listen to God's word regardless of who is preaching it. We need to learn to be thoughtful in our prayers understanding what the will of the Lord is and praying in that way. We need to sing from the heart. I know Timothy gives us these new songs that we don't know sometimes. I get that. It's okay. You'll learn it. You'll learn it. But we can still see the words and we can still try because it's really about the words. It's about putting those things in our hearts. I appreciate the songs he brings to us. We should give to the church for the work of the Lord. And you know what? On the back end of that, help the, help the church use those funds for the work of the Lord. If you see something needs to be done or could be done, bring that up. We should eat the supper with the remembrance of the greatest sacrifice that has ever been made. sacrifice of our Lord. Let's not be spoiled, but be ever grateful for the gift that God has given us. If you were ready to take advantage of that tonight, what the Bible tells us is we must hear the gospel. We must hear the words of Jesus. In John 5 and verse 24, he says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. And so we've got to hear his words and then we need to believe. Believe in God is what Jesus was saying there. But in John chapter 6 and verse 47, He says, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. We must believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. In Luke chapter 15 and verse 10, he says, Likewise I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. We need to repent. Change our minds. Let that lead to a change of action in our lives in doing the will of God. We must confess. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 8, he says, Also I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man also will confess before the angels of God. And the idea is, God, Jesus is our mediator. He's our advocate. He is the one who will confess our name to the Father. He is the one that will take our name to the Father and say, Yeah, he's worthy of coming on in. So if we're not willing to confess his name on earth, he's not going to be willing to confess ours to the Father. And then we must be baptized. In John chapter 3 and verse 5, he told Nicodemus, Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. If you are here this evening and you have not been transferred into the kingdom of God, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, he just told us how to do that. You must be born of water and the Spirit. What is that? It's baptism. You're buried with Him in that watery grave to rise up to walk a new life. Your sins are washed away. And then we must remain faithful in our lives. What does remain faithful mean? It means we're enduring temptation. It means we're staying true to His Word. It means that we're putting our heart and soul into loving God. He says in Matthew 24, verse 13, But he who endures to the end 
shall be saved. We must endure to the end. This evening, I hope, I hope this lesson has helped you. It helped me to study and think about these things. We need to learn to not be spoiled in the things that we do. We need to learn to do what we're told, and we need to learn to put our whole heart into it. And that includes our everyday living as a Christian in this world. If there is a way that we can help you tonight, would you come forward and meet me up front? If we just need to talk about it, whatever it is, won't you come while we stand, while we sing?